Welcome in, everybody, to that time of the week where my voice sounds like this. It's like I have a radio and television degree from a prestigious university in Southern Illinois, which will not be named. This is Sad Times. My name is Kevin. I'm your host. For those of you who have never listened to Sad Times, here's a quick primer. Each week, we have a kind and generous guest who comes on and tells stories about times in their life where they were sad, upset, angry, where they went through horrible grief and trauma. Uh, And the goal here is for them to tell the story. It's not for us to diagnose it or judge it. But to allow that story to be told so that you at home or in the boardroom or, you know, driving to McDonald's can hear this and maybe find some commonality in that and then maybe feel that you want to tell your story to some other people, too. Um, So that's Sad Times. And uh, we do have a website now, www.sadtimespodcast.com, or you can just look in the show notes and you'll find it there. So... That's all the fun stuff. Let's get to our sponsor now. This is another sponsor that Brent has found. So uh, right here, the sponsor is Health Maintenance Organizations. Never heard of us? Sure you have. You've heard us in the cries of kind and well-meaning people who scream, Why HMO to the sky? That's HMOs. We're here when your primary care provider calls their second cousin who knows three specialists in Indiana who can see you in 18 to 27 months from now, as long as there's a cancellation. Want to get health care and have it none of it be easy? Try health maintenance organizations. You will not thank us in the future, but if you do, you have to do it through your primary care provider. Wow. All right. Cool. And as always, folks, we can't do this without our sponsors. So please visit and support our sponsors. Use the code F-A-K-E. That's F-A-K-E. All right. Enough of that bullshit. Let's get to our guest today. It is Elliot. Elliot, how are you doing, man? I am doing uh, quite well on this uh, fine Monday. Monday. Yes. uh, Monday from the past, I guess, when this whenever this airs. Yes. Right. Just say it's Tuesday, because that's when it'll come out. All right, it's Tuesday. Tuesday. It's Tuesday, man. What a Tuesday it is. God, I fucking love Tuesdays, don't you? It's great. Favorite day of the week. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. There you go. Um, How's your day been? It's good. Um, Just a a pretty typical day of uh, doing commuting. I'm I'm the only, was the only one in the office today. Oh, wow. On my uh, hybrid company. So, uh, you know, kicked off the shoes and and went... uh, Went just in the socks today. Is that um, is that relaxing? It kind of is. Like, yeah. um, it's it's very. Every time I go in there and there's no one else in there, it's very. You showed up to school on Saturday vibes. Ah, like there's no rules governing anything. Like you can do whatever you want while you're there. So without fear of repercussion to a to an extent. Do you think your HR is going to listen to this episode? I mean, literally, uh, HR and I have a, have an understanding. Oh. Like, I literally, <laughs> they literally released the handbook last week, and I was like, "This code of conduct thing concerns me." And they're like, "You're why we have it." Yeah, <laughs> that's way. Right. At least they're honest with you, Elliot. Yeah, I know that's exactly nice. where I stand. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, Elliot, you and I grew up in the same uh, small town in Illinois. We did. And did. Y- you were uh, a pretty pretty good athlete in high school. You played soccer and did track, right? Yes, um, I I did soccer and like soccer. I still play soccer today. Um, really? Are you still a keeper? I'm still a keeper. Um, a couple of my fingers are going in odd directions now oh, from various yeah. injuries. Yeah, but um, I'm still trying to do it. And um, you know, I I'm, I'm finally I, I turned forty this year. Hey, um, and am in the over thirty league, which is basically forty year olds who don't want to play with twenty year olds. Sure, but you know now it's like oh, there's some over forty leagues. Like you thinking about be, making the switch? I, I mean, I would, I might add, add, add do an add on where it's like I could be like a rookie in the over forty <laughs> league. Like that's right. Like that hasn't happened in a while. So you could be the prodigy. So so yeah, did uh did soccer and track and uh, tried to kind of. Stay, stay busy, and in, in a in all that a small town in in central Illinois could offer. Yes, and uh, when we were growing up there, it had a nice video store. It did. It actually had two. Well, then three. There was that third one by the square once. I don't. It's by the brown bag. One. Okay. Welcome to Monticello Talk. <laughs> um, and but yeah, there wasn't a lot to do. We didn't have a movie theater. None of that fun stuff. You had to mm. drive to the big city, Champaign or Savoy. 
Uh, and what did you do in track and field? I was a thrower. So um, I mainly did in high school, you can do uh, the shot put and the discus. Um, the shot put is a 12 pound and the discus is a little bit lighter than the uh, sort of Olympic standard. Um, but I was not very good at shot just for, I don't know why I just never was um, just cause I wasn't as big as some of the other people, but I was very good at discus. Um, so I went to state twice in the discus and got to the finals uh, the second year I was there. So I finished like 12th. The, state, the finals in state? Yeah, so I finished, wow. I finished 12th in the state my senior year. And then, um, so that was fun. And then I went and did, um, I never thought I was good enough for soccer. Just a massive sort of inferiority complex and just not thinking I was good enough. Um, but like I did want to do track and I did do track. And then when you move into college, you get to play with all the new toys, which is you get uh, most notably um, you can start messing around with the hammer and its indoor cousin, which is basically a 35 pound ball and a handle. Um, and the uh, you can also do javelin and javelin's a little more specific. And I, I never really did much javelin because it's very, very difficult because um, it's, you're, you're throwing things that are, you know, a couple pounds or up to 35 pounds and the javelin is like 800 grams. Right. So it's, it's very, it's a very different kind of feel, but like I was, I, I did discus, but like the, it's like a long season. So I ended up just doing the indoor season, which just meant, um, you either do shot put or weight. And then again, shot put, not great weight. I was very good at, um, I just actually had my school record broken this year. Um, really? So I held it. I held it for like. Well, the record I assume is distance of some sort. Oh uh, yeah, um, I was around. I was just over fifty-one feet. Wow. Um, uh, but somebody broke it this year, and I was like, I was kind of hoping. I think I got to like nineteen years or something. Um, and I was hoping to get. I was hoping to buy my school record a legal drink. And hold <laughs> yeah. it for 21 years. But. Well, too bad your school record isn't in Europe because it <laughs> yeah. could have been a legal drink. Yeah, there it is. And for those of you who are not in the studio, which is everyone but Elliot, myself, Brent, and Wade, uh, Wade wanted me to point out that Brent also threw the discus and the shot put, and he went to state. All right, Brent, are you fucking done? <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. We're bonding over here. Oh, yeah. stop it. All right, right on. And so you... Went to state in high school, and then you went, like you just said, you you did track in college. Um, where'd you go? To, you went to a small school, right? Yeah, I went, like, we were talking before we started that I very much grew up in the Big Ten. Um, like, we grew up, you know, about 20 minutes outside of Champaign-Urbana right. and uh, the U of I. My parents split up um, before I had even memories, so, like, I have no memories of my parents together, but my dad lived in... Uh, East Lansing, Michigan, so spent, you know, selected weeks and holidays um, in East Lansing near Michigan State. And then my grandmother lived in Madison, Wisconsin, next to UW. So, like, mm -hmm. very much grew up in the Big Ten and was like, oh, I, you know, definitely Big Ten, man. Like, I've grown up in a Big Ten. And then, like, you know, it came time to start to go to college. I'm like, I do not want to go to a big school at all. Like, I just don't. That just seems like an extension of, of sort of high school. And like, so wait, but our high school wasn't very big. I know that's the weird thing, right? Yeah. Like, but just growing up and seeing like just these huge campuses and like, I'm just like, I don't really want that. Like, I want something a little bit where I can go and be weird and do all the things. Um, yeah. Because I felt like <laughs> in going to like a big school, it's like you feel you felt like, you know, it's like you got to like, you know, declare for a college and then like you're like locked in and then like all this other thing. So like, uh, let's go to small liberal arts school. That's kind of what I exclusively looked at to go to. Um, and I eventually went to Beloit college where, um, I am fourth generation in my family. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, so now where is Beloit college? Beloit is just over the border, um, in Wisconsin. So just North of Rockford. Oh, okay. Um, so South Beloit is in Illinois mm -hmm. and Beloit is in Wisconsin. Mm. Um, so it was about 1,200 students. Um, 
again, just did a lot of different stuff where I could, you know, I could, I could do a sport and, you know, like, not that I was good enough to play in like D1 or D2, um, and boy, it was D3, but you know, you can do a sport, but you can also do other things. You're not just in that sport all the time. Um, like the bigger sports schools are. So, um, you know, I could go and try different things. Like I tried fencing and like I oh, did fencing. That's cool. Um, I did all the different activities. I did some, like I did some drama stuff. I did, um, you know, I was in a fraternity, uh, like all kinds of stuff across the board, just doing I did not declare a major until I was a junior. Um, which by then I had to sit down there like, okay, we, we got to get serious. And here. what was your major? What did it end up being? I, I basically got to be a political science major by accident, which oh. was, which was just taking classes that looked interesting to me. Uh -huh. And then I sat down and I'm like, I'm, I'm like half, I'm like three quarters of the way to the major. Um, so I might as well just declare. And then I got a philosophy minor. Cause I, I again had the enough philosophy class and I, I actually waited until like, um, <laughs> like second semester of senior year to declare it and like the, the department chair who i knew was like it's like i was like phil i want to be a philosophy minor and he's like stop messing around elliot i'm like i'm like no i've got all the classes he's like really i'm like yeah here's everything that i got here's my checklist he's like all right fine that's cool there you go <laughs> Well, so it sounds like you went to the small college and you were able to be weird. I mean, yeah. you're, you're able to do not just the track, but like you, drama you did. And then those just able to take classes that you wanted to take, which is yeah. cool. And just not be kind of boxed in. And like, I never, like, especially in high school too, like I never, I never really was in a click or I don't consider myself to have been in like a click, like, because I was like an athlete, but I was also, you know, in Scholastic Bowl and like, hell yeah, and all these other things. So like, I didn't want to be like, you know, pigeonholed. And I felt like, you know, going to the smaller school, you're not going to get pigeonholed. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. And when you were a senior there at school, uh, you met someone. Who did you meet? I met uh, Elise Freed Brown, um, who, yes, was a freshman there mm -hmm. at the time. Um the connection was uh, I was TAing um, her, one of her roommates' courses. And through the course of just, you know, being, you know, continuing the theme of being weird, you know, you know, you occasionally <laughs> cross a line. Like, oh. Um, and I, I probably crossed the line a little bit in making a, a offhanded comment. Uh, and uh, her roommate immediately came back to her and, and said, if you ever meet, this guy named Elliot, stay away from him. He is a weirdo. Um, <laughs> and so the first time I met her, or the first time I remember meeting her, uh, like I, you know, introduced myself and um, she immediately said, oh, I've heard about you. That's an odd thing to hear. Yeah, that's. Uh, so what did you say to that? I was like, I was like, uh, I am, I am nothing if not a gentleman and uh, yeah. A, uh, a would-be scholar, and I, I don't know where this is coming from. I am, and I don't I'm know why. thinking about having a philosophy mind. Like, God why, damn it. why, um, why would you say these things? And like, what reputation? Because I've I've not worked in any way to have a reputation. So, um, over the course of uh, you know, several weeks and and maybe months, the uh, the uh, the misconceptions were were torn down, and and we eventually started dating. Uh, uh, later that semester. Um, and uh, then I graduated and, and we felt it would be best for both of us if we broke up um, as I was moving across the country to do an internship in California. Mm. And uh, so there was that was very tough, but we stayed in touch. We exchanged phone calls and, and some postcards um, during my travels. And then I ran out of money and had no job. So I moved back to the Midwest and to Madison, actually, and which is only about 45 minutes to an hour from Beloit. And then, you know, went back to visit Beloit when I returned and we immediately started dating again. Okay. And how, wait, how long were you out in California before you came back? It wasn't that long. I was out there for like five months. Okay. Uh, so, so you guys were broke up for about five months. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we were broke up for like five months. But you still kept in touch. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love the postcards, by the way. I think yeah. that's great. She was she was much better at postcards than I was, yeah. like, <laughs> if we're being honest. That's fair. <laughs> and okay, so you guys, you came back, you started dating again. You were living, so only 45 minutes to an hour away. Mm-hmm. Um, where'd you guys go from there? So we went there, and so we we were dating throughout that and kind of doing, like, split weekends where, you know, she might come up to Madison for a weekend, but then I would go down to Beloit for a weekend um, and uh, kind of doing our thing and, and enjoying it. And then, you know, she finished undergrad and immediately wanted to go to grad school because she wanted to do museum studies, which you more or less need um, advanced degrees on um, to even – think about getting a job and even then it's it's tough um so we moved out to new jersey together um where she went to seton hall um in south orange new jersey and we spent two years there i was just kind of working a the the really cliche of post-college like i'm working for a -a rent-a-car company um (laughs) uh which was it wasn't horrible, um, but, you know, it paid the bills and we were close to New York City. So, like, you know, on yeah. the weekends we would just, you know, grab the train into New York City and, and hang out in New York. And it was it was great. But, you know, after that, um, after she finished, we were both kind of like this. Uh, the pace of life in the East Coast is not for us. Um, it's definitely different. It's just, you know, I in. I always tell people this, you live, you live on the West coast. I lived on the West coast for a little bit briefly in, in the East coast. And like in the West, when I lived in the West coast, everyone would said, um, Oh, you're moving away. Why would you live anywhere else? This is like the perfect place. And I'm like, that's insane. Um, and then we moved when we were in the East coast and in Jersey, there were several times where both of us were accused of they're like, people would stop and say like, you're, you're from the Midwest, right? And we're like, yes, how uh, could you tell? They're like, you're too nice. Hmm. Um, so, and then we would, we would tell them like we moved here from, you know, you know, Wisconsin. They're like, why would you move here? So you've got the West coast. Why would you move anywhere else? The East coast. Why would you live here? And then you get to like the Midwest and everyone's just like, oh, hi. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Yeah. Doesn't this weather suck? <laughs> um, so yeah, we moved back to Chicago in uh, 2010. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, pretty quick after that, I proposed. Oh, that's awesome. And we were married actually in Madison. We got married in Madison in 2012. Okay. And you graduated school, what, 2005? 2005. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, married in 2012 and you're, you guys are still in Chicago at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then um, you guys were just kind of settling in, doing the Chicago thing, doing Mm -hmm. the lovely Midwestern city thing. Uh, Was she from around Chicago? Yeah. She, her family is from like the North Shore, like um, from uh, like Evanston, Wilmette area. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, very much if, if there are listeners outside the area, this is a straight mean girls country. Um, uh, when they say North shore high and make a Walker's brothers pancake house, like that is deep, deep, like Will Matt. Okay. Um, so you guys are living in Chicago and did you get, did you get to see your family a lot since were they still close? Yeah. Yeah. We had, um, uh, her, her dad lived, had lived here, um, like since the outset and has always been here. And her parents split up uh, relatively early when we were dating. And her mom so- sort of stayed in um, the area for a little bit, but then got remarried and moved to a town of like 200 people in Minnesota. Um, wow. Which is crazy. Does Garrison Keeler live there? I mean, it's it's close. Like, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of the same thing. You're moving into a, a very small community. But um, so her mom was, you know, relatively close and in the area and her dad was here and her dad, you know, eventually got, uh, remarried as well. Um, that was a little further down the line, but then her, um, her brother, her older brother moved back to town, um, a couple years after us and put down roots and they have a, a, is a lovely family. Um, they're just had their third kid. Um, 
And so we had, you know, her dad, you know, her, her older brother, and then her younger brother did a PhD at, uh, University of Chicago. Um, so, um, there was always sort of her family around and, and my family is still, you know, kind of, my dad's still in, you know, East Lansing. So that's like three, four hours away. And my mom's like still in the general Monticello area. She's in Decatur now. And so, you know, lots of family around. Good. Okay. Right on. So, and then, you know, about five years later, after you got married, um, you and, and Elise were so kind, and you you came to the the one man show that I did, and then we all went out and had a beer afterwards and hung out. Yep. Uh, so that's 2017. So you guys have been married about five years at this point. Um, and what was going on then? So we had just gotten back. We had literally just gotten back from a, a trip to France. We went to Paris for uh, four or five days, and. Leading up to that, Elise had been in uh, some pain and some discomfort, um, which intensified a little bit. So she'd gone to the doctor before um, we left and, you know, everything presenting, it was like, they're like, oh, you have a sciatica, you know, you have, um, you know, sort of overall, like a sort of a back pain, but like, you know, some some weakness in the leg. Mm -hmm. Um, They're like, it's sciatica, like here's some muscle relaxers here's some painkillers, you know, it'll go away. And, you know, we did the trip and she had some mobility issues and, uh, we got back and nothing got better. So it's, it's kind of like, okay, like went back to the doctor, like eventually the pain got in too intense enough where we had to go to the emergency room. Oh no. Um, so we did that and it was kind of like, I mean, I'd have to look back at the timing of everything, but like, it felt like a very long time in terms of like, you know, they obviously triaged her pain and got her a better pain regiment and they were doing all these tests, um, and not, not sort of finding anything for a reason or not finding anything. I think there was one time where like, they thought they had like some like brittle bone syndrome and then like, you know, they were scanning for. Um, other things like they did a, uh, a biopsy on like her hip bone, which is, you know, where they basically just like kind of drill in and oh my God. take a piece out. Yeah. Um, uh, so they did that, you know, nothing there. Um, and then eventually, you know, through all the tests, we eventually met with a surgeon and I don't even know how the surgeon came into it, but, um, you know, growing up, she had, um, fibroids on her breast, which are just, you know, essentially lumps on her breast, which, you know, obviously like when she was growing up, like she had them checked out, you know, extensively, but they're like, no, this is just sort of fibroid tissue. It's, it's nothing, it's nothing untoward. So like, you know, obviously when, when people start talking about lumps and stuff like that, it, it becomes very concerning. So, you know, obviously they had talked about that as maybe a possibility, but every doctor we went to was like sort of examined the lumps and were like, no, this is not cancer because it doesn't have any of the telltale cancer signs. Like apparently like the, the edges are supposed to be sharp and like, you know, sort of uh, somewhat irregular and they really weren't. So like, I think, you know, probably watched dozens of people touch my wife's breasts um, <laughs> oh my. And, and say, uh, say, uh, yeah, we don't think that's anything. And then she went to the surgeon. The surgeon was like, yeah, this could be something. Um, now wait. Okay. So you've been told by multiple doc. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I just want to ask you, you've been told, oh no, no, this is fine. It, it's not presenting like cancer, et cetera. What did it, what was it like when he said this might be something? I mean, it's, uh, we still didn't know. So like the frustration was like in not knowing and like, So like we couldn't, we could just treat the pain. We couldn't treat anything that was causing the pain. So they said cancer and like, obviously like it's the first person to say it in a serious way. So like you are going to a very, a very dark place very quickly. And then, you know, he took basically uh, like a type of, of tissue sample and this was right around Easter 2017. And like, we were working with our, we had to go into our primary, her primary care doctor. And like, this was like Easter weekend and like, they didn't get the results. And the doctor was like, no, you're getting these results for us. Like yeah, good. these people are not waiting 
like a long weekend to figure this out. And like, it came back as positive. Um, so it was like that moment, it was sort of everything snaps into focus. And, you know, we, we, we sort of discussed this before, but it's, it's a matter of like, okay, it, this is the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. But at the same time, we now know what we're fighting and we haven't known yeah. for so long. So there's a bit of a relief and it's like, oh, they have things to treat cancer. So we, we're treat, we can treat the cancer now, um, as opposed to, you know, just trying to mitigate the pain. Which it, and it sounds like the pain was getting worse and I, I've, I've never had, thankfully, you know, sciatica, but I know people who have obviously this, mm -hmm. but that I, I hear that pain is just terrible. Yeah. So what it was, was the, the cancer had spread, um, to, and, you know, metastasized to, um, her liver, her lungs and onto, um, you know, onto her pelvis. And that's where it was pushing on the sciatic nerve, which is why it was presenting as sciatic. And this, had, it had all spread even before she was diagnosed. Yeah, absolutely. So it was stay like it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, stage four metastatic breast cancer, um, is what it was diagnosed as. Um, how old were you guys at this time? So this would have been 2017. So, um, Elise would have been, uh, like 31. She had just turned 31. Jeez. Um, and, uh, so, you know, all these kind of tests and like the early stuff is like, you're just, you get, you get absolutely blown up with information in terms of like, you know, this is what's going to happen. And this is like the, the, um, the chemotherapy and like, you know, at stage four, like what I didn't understand, it's like, oh, so are we going to have like a mastectomy here? Like what's, what's, what's going on? And like the doctor's like, no, this is, this is stage four cancer. Like it's like that, that ship has sailed. Like it's already spread. Like you, you would do the mastectomy to prevent it from spreading. Right. Like, so now we just have to treat the straight up cancer. So, and there's no, there's no real like remission after stage four. They don't consider it remission. You always have cancer. Really? It's just like, I think you get to the, you get to like zero detectable disease, almost kind of like, like an HIV thing where it's just like, but the, the tumors are kind of always going to be there. Um, so we started a pretty obviously aggressive course of chemo and radiation. And the radiation was mainly just to shrink the metastases on her um, like hip and pelvis to try and restore some mobility. And it, it never really happened. So she never got better in terms of movement. She got better in, in terms of pain, but like she was able to move around a little bit more, but like, you know, from there on, she was, she started out, you know, she had to be on a walker. Um, and she eventually worked up to a cane. Um, after the radiation, after the radiation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, that was kind of the reality is, is doing, you know, the chemo thing. We went and got a couple of second opinions. They're like, they're doing exactly what we would do. Um, so as long as you like, you can come here if you want. Um, but we, we tried to get in some clinical trials, but like, there's not a lot of, yeah. um, clinical trials specifically for stage four. Um, just cause it's, it's not a high win rate. <laughs> um, so yeah, that kind of became reality in terms of like managing, appointments and you know we had a we had a we had a fantastic physical therapist that we got through a family friend that actually like you know compared to like we had some bad physical therapists or occupational therapists that came in and just did like the the insurance mandated thing and um uh we went to somebody who really knew what they were doing and it's like this is magic um so, so it provided her some relief. Then. Yeah, it provided some relief and also some mobility. And that's the one yeah. thing because, like, you know, it's it's the one thing of, like, you know, someone at 31, like, think about losing your independence. 
um, in a way. Yeah, I wanted to ask, even before the diagnosis, the mobility was such that, could she walk? She could walk, but she was in, she was in quite a bit of pain. Okay. Um, like, I think there was one point where, like, I think she went to the store and was, like, literally almost crawling up the stairs because she just couldn't get up the stairs, like, because, like, the stairs were always rough. And I was <sighs> like, I'm like, this has to stop. Like, you know, we'll we'll go to more doctors, but, like, you know, I'll take over the, the shopping and stuff, but, like, you can't be in this much pain and, like, do the negular stuff. So... Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and it, it, essentially what it boils down to is because this stuff is pressing not necessarily on muscles or anything or tendons, it's, it's strictly neuropathic. Oh God. Um, so it's like, you know, it's like, you know, describing it as like, it's on fire. Um, and there's nothing you can really do to, to kind of mitigate that. It's not like, you know, you have a muscle ache, you can kind of like, you know, give it a rub, rub it. Right. This is just, no, it's not that it just like, it just like pops up and can be super intense. Um, and you know, there's nothing you can do immediately. You can, you know, ma try and manage it. And there's some, you know, um, you know, a, a fair amount of morphine was, uh, was had just, you know, in, in sort of slow release and like instant release. Okay. But you know, after the diagnosis, so how often were you going to appointments as you started the treatment plan? So it started where I think if I'm recalling correctly, the, we did like uh, 20 or so sessions of radiation, which was every day. Um, uh, how long is a session? It's not very long. It's maybe you go in and it's like 20 or 30 minutes of them just like setting up and doing the radiation and, um, you know, sort of rinse, repeat and do that for a set regiment for a set part. Um, so that was like every day. And then I think we were doing chemo every other week or every third week um with varying doses and that's just basically for people who haven't gone through it uh you go in and you basically do sort of your pre-chemo where you get a bunch of other drugs that will help mitigate the side effects of the chemo um so like they like they load you up uh they like load they like shoot you up full of benadryl um, to prevent any sort of like allergic reaction. So it's like most of the time she would get the Benadryl and just be like, I'm out. Like, yeah. I mean, God damn, I take one Benadryl and I'm out. <laughs> um, so, you know, do that. And then there was two courses of chemo that we were doing initially. One of them was like over three hours and one of them was over four hours. So these were kind of like half day appointments of where you were there in the infusion center for like five, six hours. Oh. Um, and, for those who don't know, because I don't think it's 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 really just an it's an IV, right? That they just put in you. Is that, um, is that how they were no. giving it to? You? No, it's not. <laughs> it's okay. like so. Um, yeah, it's like the the chemo is so gnarly um, in terms of just like you know you you go to the doctor's office and you see like um, you know the the disposal things for like the needles and the the vials and everything. And like, there's like an entirely separate one for chemo because they are so toxic. Um, and in terms of like the IV, because like, you know, there's, there's possibility of leakages and like, you know, you're constantly going in, they put in a port, um, directly into like a major, um, like artery or vein that's like constantly in you. So like, basically they just have to, and it was like right kind of like around her chest area, like just above her chest, where they they can basically like easily lock in and access that and just give it directly through the port. Is there concerns about that getting infected? No, no. I mean, it, if it's done right, it just kind of stays there. And then okay. it's just like just you can feel it just underneath the skin. Um, and, um, you know, they do it with like a, a small surgical procedure that takes like 20 or 30 minutes to put in there. Um and then they can easily just like they have a thing where they just easily hooks into the port. Um, so it's it's like you're not you're not constantly having someone to find your vein because like, of course, yeah, like you're taking I mean, they're taking blood every time and like <sighs> doing all this other stuff. So like, you know, it makes sense to like have essentially a shortcut. <laughs> um, right. 
And it's also, you know, safer with the chemo drugs. Would you be able to sit with her uh, yeah. during the treatments? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I was at most of the appointments. My my job at the time was very good and was, you know, this was... This was in uh this was in 2017 and 2018 folks so remote work was uh <laughs> very in its in its infancy if you will um but you know I was able to get some work done uh when I was at these infusion appointments or just the general appointments um and you know we basically did them like once a week so like you know the like Fridays we would go to you know do doctors appointments and like I would I would work from work remotely and, and kind of get what I need to get done and sit in the infusion center and just, you know, chill out. Cause kind of like, you know, Elise was sleeping most of the time. So yeah. I would just, you know, work or, and you know, her, when her family was in town, occasionally her family would come by, but I was at most of those, I think pretty much all those chemo appointments. Mm. Um, and then, uh, you, you talked about the drugs that they give you load you up on before chemo. Do they give you anything to try to help with the nausea or anything like that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like they, that's part of the, that's part of the, the, the drugs. Okay. Um, and you know, they have, you know, they, she obviously had to, to deal with the symptoms like between her, um, opioids, which there was a lot of, um, and, um, uh, then she was on a drug to help try and limit the neuropathic pain. Um, we were taking what was called gabapentin, um, which which seemed to help in like so varying, like constantly kind of titrating the doses to get it right. Um, but she didn't have that much nausea. She didn't lose that much appetite. We did get also also in Illinois in 2017. We were still not on recreational marijuana, but we oh. were certainly on medical. So we did get that, and I don't think it it made a huge difference because she didn't really have a lot of those gnarly side effects. That's really good to hear, though. But you know, the we were at, so we were at a, um, we were in a like President St. Joseph's, which is a, which is a Catholic hospital, and um, we had a fairly young oncologist. I mean, I. Again, like this whole the, this whole thing was like the point where I'm like, oh, I'm older than these doctors now, and that's, that's weird. weird. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's weird that I'm older than all the baseball players for crying <laughs> out loud. Um, but uh, our our doctor was very cool, and we loved her, and uh, we like you know breached the marijuana thing, and she's like, absolutely, like I'm hundred percent behind this, and like you know we went through all the thing and you got to fill out like your application. Then your doctor gets to fill out an application. You got to like send them in at the same time. Um, and like we sent it to our doctor and like our doctor was like, this is like my first one. I've never had to do this, but this is very cool. Like I'm excited about this. Uh -huh. Um, and so she's like, yeah, I'll get this done like today. Perfect. And, um, we were, we were doing our chemo, our infusion after that. And then like one of the nurses came in, it's like, so, um, Dr. Garcia let us know that the uh, official uh, policy of the Catholic hospital that we are at is they are not for medical marijuana. And um, <laughs> she's very confused by this. Um, the nurse was like, I'm Catholic, go to mass every week. I'm very confused by this. Um, so... <laughs> We basically had to do the thing where you you go to like some quack doctor for like three weeks and then they sign your application. Like it was literally like a place called a clinic called the Healing Center. The Healing Center. So go ahead and acronym that out for me if you could. T and the H and the C. Oh, so it's not just a clever name. It is not just a clever there name. There we go. Okay. Um, I have. When you told me that thing about the hospital and the Catholic hospital not allowing medical marijuana for somebody who is suffering in such a degree that your wife was, for those of you who can't see, which is everybody who's listening, I took my glasses off and about poked both my eyes out of my head as I was rubbing my eyes out of frustration. Anyway. Okay. So, so yeah, there was, uh, there was, there was that to kind of mitigate, um, and, uh, that was kind of like life. And then every, um, every couple months they would rescan the tumors to kind of see where we were at. And, you know, we saw sort of more or less, uh, steady decline cause the radiation mainly, um, cause that's going to shrink them anyway. But then we saw kind of 
um, it would go back and forth because there was different tumors and like one would get smaller and one would get like a little bigger. Um, <sighs> and then they would like adjust the chemo a little bit um, and kind of, you know, restart it or like, I think we changed chemo regimens once or twice during this time where they just like, we're going to try like a different drug. Um, and then I think at one point we had pursued maybe doing some studies and they were like, the doctor was like, one of the doctors from another place was like, it's worth pursuing, you know, talking to your doctor about, you know, instead of doing like a heavier dose every two weeks or three weeks, doing a steady dose once a week. Like, you know, obviously that involves more time in the clinic, but we had time to give. So it's like we did that and that seemed to be working better. Um, so, yeah, that was just kind of it's like, how long can we like we can stay with this until it gets better or until it, you know, and just maintain. How far from the diagnosis did you guys change to that once a week chemo? Do you recall? Um, Probably, I think it was probably early, maybe early 2018 or so. I think we started so going. So about through. nine nine months? Yeah, maybe? probably a, a solid like six or seven months after okay. after we started. Okay. So at this point, now you, you had mentioned earlier that she had come back from shopping. She was having trouble getting up the stairs. Um, you're like, listen, uh, you know, everybody in a partnership, you you split up the household duties, whatever mm -hmm. they may be. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to take over that part, yeah. blah, 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 blah. At this point, were you more of not just a partner, but also a caretaker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, like my sort of protective and like um, sort of instincts kicked in. I'm just like, I can do all this. Like, you know, and Elise was incredibly independent and she didn't want to give certain things up. I'm like, that's fine. But like, you know, obviously certain things like, you know, I want to do. And also it's like we have to be we have to be super careful in terms of like, you know, what you do, um, obviously physically, because like, you know, a fall was always a risk, mm. um, mm. because of her mobility issues and, and it wasn't necessarily weakness, but it's just like, she doesn't just doesn't have like, you know, the balance that she has because of the, uh, the issues with the, uh, on the sciatica. Um, so that, and just, you know, uh, trying to be protective of that, but also just there was a couple times, you know, cause chemo basically suppresses your immune system. Right. So you're, you become immunocompromised again, like all these terms that we learned, like during pandemic, like immunocompromised and you know, all this other stuff, like that is the reality of many cancer patients because of chemo. So it's like, Oh, the people who wanted to come and visit, do you have the sniffles? You're not coming. Um, so just being protective in that, I know there was a few times, like, especially early on where it was like, you know, people were in town and it's like, you know, friends or, you know, old friends. And it's like, Oh, somebody had a cold. I'm just like, no, yeah, no, just like, so shifting that dynamic from like your, your partner to both your partner and your caregiver is insanely difficult because in terms of like wanting them to be happy, but also having to say no or which is a totally new dynamic, which is a totally new dynamic. And it's also just like, you know, you start to do the calculation of like, we want to go do this thing, but how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. How are you going to get around? Like, and is that doable? That and, you know, trying to, hey, I can't do it, but trying to think it being in my early thirties and being told something as simple as, no, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. It had to have been maddening. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was heartbreaking in, you know, and we can, we can obviously like, if, if people are listening, they know where this is going. Um, <laughs> but um, we're, we're, we're spoiler free for yeah, right now. That, that's um, true. Um, but it was the idea that early on you would see her, um, you know, struggling or like walking or like limping around, you know, our, our condo. And it was like the thought washing over me of like, she's never going to get better. Like she's never going to get movement back. Like, and having to accept that and just be like, her knowing that like, not just in like, you know, the flip side is like, 
me having to sort of be that, but also like her and like I, I had some insight into her, her sort of mindset into this, obviously, because we talked all the time, but like she wouldn't want, like I would, I wouldn't want to limit her in the same way that she wouldn't want to limit me, which is to say that do the things that I wanted to do, but like not have to worry about her in the same way, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yes. Um, like she would, she wouldn't want me to think of not doing something because of her. Like that would feel like the worst thing in the same way that like, I wouldn't want to tell her that she couldn't do something because of concerns of, of her too. So it's like this sort of like double guilt machine of not wanting to tell the other that like, we can't do these things anymore. And that on top of the treatment, on yeah. top of the disease, on yeah. top of everything else. So, yeah. And just to, you know, there's, there's parallels, but just think about, and we can get in this a little more later in the story, but think about, you don't, it's the, it's, it's the frog in the pot, not knowing that it's boiling or that it's slowly boiling. It's like, you don't realize how much stress you're under from this change in, you know, your relationship, uh, to like this life threatening illness. Um, you don't realize the sheer amount of stress that that causes. And then also add into that, not just the stress of that, but like, you know, you go and do these appointments and you go and do blood work and you go and get the tests and you go and get the scans. And it's like, you're literally living, you know, day to day, hour to hour after these tests of like, what is this going to be? What is this going to mean? Cause like this test that's happening right now could have absolutely massive implications yeah. for what happens today, tomorrow, next week. So you can't, like the idea of planning anything is like absurd because it could change in an instant. Like one of these tests could completely change everything in an instant. <sighs> yeah. You should have a drink of that there. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So by early 2018, you've moved to um, once a week mm -hmm. chemo and around what what was what did the first um scan show after you'd moved from once a week chemo uh at, on on the tumors we had gotten like i mean this was probably spring of 2018 um we had gotten like i had i had quit my job because i was working at a, a job that was very um sort of holiday oriented where i you know during the holiday season between you know thanksgiving and christmas i was clocking 60 to 70 hours a week um, are you Santa? I'm, I am. I am not Santa. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, and I was like, I can't, there's, there's no fucking way. Yeah. Like something's got to give, I can't reasonably assume that they're going to make a, a, like a, any sort of reasonable exception or like, I can't do my job in the same way. Um, like it just, it just doesn't, it's not going to work. Um, and that, that was always in the back of my mind. And then things kind of deteriorated there to a point where I'm just like, Nope, we're done. Like we're done. I quit in like November of 2017. Um, and kind of like restarted job search and like, you know, had enough money to kind of be around for a while, but I had started a new kind of temp job. And like, I, I remember like I was a couple weeks in and you know, she called me cause I was trying to like get set up at this job. And like, so I couldn't go to the, appointment she's like everything is everything is static nothing grew nothing you know nothing grew nothing shrank but nothing grew so like we're we're like at you know homeostasis at this point i'm like that is i remember going outside and like pumping my fist like yes that's fantastic um so that was going on and then i think she went in for an infusion and i wasn't there um and she got there and, you know, you do the thing, the, the thing is, you know, they go and they take all your vitals, you know, they draw blood, um, you know, take your temperature. And she had spiked, a, she had spiked a little bit of a fever. Oh. And so they're like, you know, obviously immunosuppressed, they're always a little concerned. And then they're like, okay, this fever's high enough. We're going to admit you. Um, 
and then and you weren't able to be there at that appointment. I wasn't at that particular one. Yeah. Like I was at work and um oh. so like I kind of I can't remember the exact sort of series of event. I think her brother was there and like her brother was like I think this is like more serious than she's letting on. And so I kind of rushed to the hospital and she was fine but like something was clearly going on and then like things started to kind of go a little south and they had something some sort of infection they didn't know what um and she needed to go on she they put her on oxygen um and then you know things kind of deteriorated fairly quickly i can't remember exa the exact timing of it um but uh because everything's kind of jumbled at this point and i think we were in the hospital and then the our doctor eventually came in because she was gone for a little bit and then she came back and she basically came in and was like so the tumors didn't grow but they have started to completely wreck your liver her liver um and this is the point where we start to consider you know other options in terms of like you know getting your affairs in order type thing so it went from you know a few weeks before of being like everything is everything's holding steady we're holding tight to yeah this is this is the end game like we're in the end game now um so that was like a whiplash that i wasn't fully expecting um, so that was very tough. And then her oxygen stats like dipped to like the point where they're like, okay, we're taking her to the ICU. Um, so up to the ICU we went. Um, and there was a couple days where it was, again, just going back to this thing where you're just, and like, especially in the ICU where everyone, you've got all the like, things hooked up to you and all this other stuff where you're like looking at, you know, real time stats of, you know, O2 oxygenation stats and they're not good. And, um, you know, they kept upping the oxygen, upping the oxygen to like as much as they could possibly give her. And it's the point where they got to the point where it's like, uh, we have to consider intubating her in terms of like, you know, putting the tube in and, Oh my God. And it was always just like, borderline so she was she was more or less you know especially at this point she was you know in and out of consciousness so like the other thing was like um and because because like the liver the liver is what you know obviously is processing toxins mm -hmm. and that's what's metabolizing um the uh the opiates um right. uh, yes so when that gets fucked up and it's not metabolizing the opiates in the same way, like you can get loopy real quick. And so like, that was the first time where she started to honestly be out of it, which is what freaked me out more than anything. Um, where she just wouldn't necessarily know what's going on. Um, which was horrible because she was always so with it. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of, we got a meeting and it was like, you know, we had had these meetings with, especially the ICU, you've got like roving posses of doctors. Um, and <laughs> it's kind of frightening. Well, no, it's well, cause everyone, everyone has their, their resident too. Like each oh, doctor has their resident. Sense. Yeah. So like the resident would come in and do something and like the residents change, like, cause there was like rotations of the residents sometimes. So it was like, we just, I just got to be like, okay, the residents are the hype men. And, <laughs> and like, we do not have to take them seriously. Okay. So we can have a little fun with them from time to time. There you, okay. Uh, Get it where you can. But, uh, um, and there were, there were, there were actually, there were very good residents and some very good residents, but like, I'm like, you guys are not, you guys are not, you have to be here, but you can't do much. And like, I, I would feel bad for you if not in this situation. Um, <laughs> right. I'd feel bad for you except for I feel I'm bad sitting. for you except like I can't feel bad about you right now. 
Um, so, you know, we kind of got that and just, you know, a couple of our doctors that, um, obviously our oncologist who had been our primary, you know, more or less our primary care doctor, um, for the longest time and like had the most information, like it was just like waiting for her. Cause like her word was going to be what we trusted the most. So eventually like when things were looking, you know, relatively bleak in the ICU, like it was like, um, you know, our oncologist and then our, um, palliative care doctor. Um, and it's like, what's a palliative care doctor? Um, palliative care is just like, it's just, it's somebody who is, you know, dealing with someone with chronic medical issues. So like, especially like older patients and okay. just like, they can't fix the thing, but they can make people more comfortable. Understood. Okay. So, you know, for lack of a better word, they are like the drug dealers. Um, like that's kind of what they do in terms of like finding the right mix of drugs to make somebody as comfortable as they want or need to be. Mm. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> so, and our, our palliative care doctor and our, our, our oncologist actually went to med school together. So they had a, actually a really good rapport. Oh, good. But, um, you know, it was, it was like that meeting where it's like, you know, and I knew when like, you know, our palliative care doctor was like, Oh, can I, can I be in on this meeting? I'm just like, Oh, I know what this is going to be. And I don't want it to happen. Um, cause it was essentially like, what do you want the end to look like? And being wholly unprepared for that. Like I was wholly unprepared for that. Uh, and at least at this point was still relatively conscious, but she's like, this still fucks me up. It's okay. But, uh, she's sitting in an ICU and she's hooked up to all these machines and like has people in and out all the time. And it's just gotta be freaked out in a way that I couldn't imagine. Cause I've never been in that situation. Um, but, um, she had, she had enough to say like, like, I just, she's like, I just want more time with Elliot. Five years later, it still breaks me. Yeah. And so it definitely broke me then in terms of, you know, someone who's clearly suffering so much, but just wants to extend it to be present. And so, yeah. And it was just at that point where I'm just like, well, like, I don't, you know, I don't want her to suffer anymore. Yeah. Like, you know, so we started talking about, you know, um, DNRs and all that fun stuff. Um, and uh, more or less after that, she recovered like to a certain extent. Um, this would have been like, um, like April, like April or May, like early May, I feel like. Um, okay. Uh, so she recovered and like, she was out of the ICU like a day later or two days later. Oh, wow. Um, and she obviously lost a lot of strength from that. So like we were in the hospital, I think for like another four or five days, um, just kind of recovering her strength. Uh, and, uh, you know, we eventually were, were discharged and the plan was we were going to try a new round of chemo. Like that was just strictly oral. So it was just a pill. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any of that stuff. Um, there were some other issues because of the liver failure. They had to put in basically another sort of, sort of port. It's sort of similar to a port, but it's like a plural catheter, um, which essentially because the liver wasn't processing thing, liquid would build up. So you had to like, drain the plural cavity um which was a fun team activity <laughs> um jesus which actually wasn't bad like i'm i'm like i'm fine with most of the medical stuff so like so you, it, you weren't too squeamish about i it. wasn't squeamish about it um and it was a little it was definitely gnarly um but um 
you know, it was doable. So she, we were home and I think we were, we did the chemo for like two weeks. We went back into an appointment and like our doctor's like, this is, this is not doing anything. Like it's time to go into hospice. Um, and so we set up home hospice care and then it wasn't much longer than that. Like, um, this would have been like early June, um, or so, um, early to mid June and we set up hospice. And so it was like, you're taking all of your established contacts of somebody that you've been working closely with, um, for a really long time. And then just like, you're like chucking them out for a whole new team. Um, so it's like a transition where you're just like, you don't trust these people. You don't know these people. Like, again, very good at their job, very hard job. Um, but you know, it's just like, we don't know you yet. You know, we'll, we'll do it. But like, you know, at this point, like she was, you know, declining more and more each day. So, you know, I was taking over more and more stuff in terms of like the medication. So like I had my little spreadsheet on the medication and the schedule and all that other stuff and the numbers. And, you know, within, we never, we never like got sort of like a time frame. Like, you know, you have six months to live, you have right. X amount to live. So like, we don't want to know. And like, even going into that final appointment with our oncologist, it's like, we don't want to know. And, you know, I found out after the fact that her parents were both there and they went in after and like talked to them. And like, I, you know, obviously I found this information out after the fact, but like they asked and like, I think her mom asked and like our doctor said like weeks, like, so this was, this was June. So I'll set the scene for, for June. So like June is, um, uh, the, our wedding anniversary is in June, like, uh, the 9th of June, my birthday is the 20th. Um, and then she passed away on the 28th of June in 2018. So June, June is, June is not a great month for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't think so. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. And it was, <sighs> You know, it's one of those things and, you know, getting into the processing of grief, you can, we can talk about this a little more, but the, this whole thing of like, how do you want to die? Like, and like most people will be like, um, you know, oh, in my bed surrounded by family. Right. And like, that's, that's what happened. Like, um. You know, we were, we knew it was kind of getting, I knew it was kind of getting hard and her mom was still in town and like her family was, a lot of her family was still in town. Um, her sisters and normally in Pennsylvania was in town and like a few others. So, um, you know, we had gotten to that point and I think, you know, they had this information that she had weeks to live. So like everyone was kind of hanging around as much as they could. Um, and you know, woke up one morning and like, I could tell she was really bad and like, I called like the hospice aid to like come help you know, get her cleaned up a little bit. And, um, her mom came over and helped. And then like, you know, the breathing started to get shallow and I'm like, I'm like, I think, I think this is it. Um, and a good chunk of her family was there. Um, but like, you know, this whole thing of like, um, when someone says like, Oh, I hope I die alone, you know, with, or, you know, in bed surrounded by my family. I'm like, it's not great. No, it's not. It's, it's bad. Um, and then, you know, from there again, it's one of those things where it's like, we talked about during the diagnosis period when we didn't know, it's like the waiting is the worst part. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to go about it. You don't know what your day to day is. Um, but like once you know, and you know, again, in death, it's like, oh, all these things have to start happening now. So like, if anything, like there's all this paradox of like, you know, first of all, there's this incredible pain that you knew was coming, but also like the relief of that she's not suffering, A, that she's not suffering anymore. And you're also not waiting anymore. And 
you've got something to occupy you. Like, even though it's like the worst possible thing in terms of like dealing with the bureaucracy of death, um, it's something that you can throw yourself into, which, you know, I did in terms of like making sure people were contacted and, um, you know, trying to set up some other things um, like the, you know, if we wanted to have a funeral, if we wanted to have a burial, like, you know, and we had talked about burial versus cremation and we both kind of agreed like, you know, cremation because like, we're going to burn this fucking cancer to the ground. Like at the end of the day, like that's what we're going to do. I like that a lot. Um, so all that stuff and people, you know, my mom was already on the way up. Um, so we, you know, we had that. And then people are also like the first thing that really bothered me is like all of a sudden people like start to come at you with the white glove treatment where it's like, oh, is there anything we can do? Like, you know, and it's like, I just want to do things like I want to like help plan things or do something like the and last. Are they trying to do all of that stuff for yeah, you? There's, there's part of there's part of it that they're definitely helping out with. But I'm like, I want to like you don't like I need to be a part of this, like if for nothing else, then I'm not just sitting alone with my thoughts. Um, so there was a lot of that. Um, and just like, you know, all of a sudden there's like 20 people in my, my condo and I'm like, what's going on? Um, so, um, you know, we kind of did that and then, you know, we had all the family here. So there was a great support network and in terms of setting up. And I think we set up a, a memorial like two and a half weeks later. It was right after, cause we had 4th of July first. And then it was like the week after 4th of July, we did a memorial in town, um, without a real burial. And that was, that was great, you know, to see a lot of people come in, but it's also just like, you start to, you start to get like, and I actually went back and, you know, one of the things that when she got really sick and went in the ICU, I started journaling like almost every day. Like when I got home from the hospital, I would, you know, spend eight to 10 hours there, go home, journal about it, write it down. And like, so I was trying to journal every day. Did you find that to be therapeutic? Yeah. Yeah. And that was what the first step of sort of recovery was for me. It was like having this outlet where like, I didn't have to share it with anyone mm -hmm. because like the conversations with people, like it's not, you know, I don't blame the people at all, but it's just kind of like so many people are, are unsure of what to do or what to say that they don't say much. Um, which makes you feel even more weird or even more fucked up about it. Um, so do you feel like when people don't say much, like in those situations, do you feel then like you need to try to help them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, more often than not is like when I told people or when I told people like, and started talking to people, it's like they were, they would be more upset than visibly I am. Cause obviously like I had, you know, time, to, time to deal with it. And it's like, I end up comforting them. Um, which is fine. Cause like at that point I don't need comforting like from, from that particular person. And you know, the other thing is like one of the things, and I, w I went back and read a lot of these journals after we did our initial conversation. And I was like, man, I was, I was real angry. Um, but one of the things is like, so many people post and like send you things it's like, Oh, words, words fail me or I don't have the words. And my response was, um, probably a little more flippant than needed. But like, if we don't have words, what, what are we going to do here? Like, if we don't talk about it, are you going to give me an interpretive dance? <laughs> Um, that's how I met Brent. <laughs> so, and you, to that point though, after you were very public and on social media about mm -hmm. your dealing with it. And I thought that was such a brave and courageous thing to do as well. Uh, it was almost like a public journaling. Yeah. And so that kind of, one of that came about is, you know, first and foremost is we were, we were very public with a diagnosis and the process and, I was posting and Elise was posting 
uh, she was posting like uh, sort of treatment journals where she would give, try and give like a weekly update because if anything, that was like the most expedient way to do things, but also get it out. So like most of our, most of our stuff in terms of diagnosis and treatment was, was out there. And then when, you know, the worst possible thing happened, my feeling was why, why is this, this suddenly become private when everything leading up to it was public why does this sudden, why do we flip a switch to make this private? So I was sort of uh, committed to, to making it public. Um, and it didn't, it didn't really feel like a choice to me. I'm just like, this is just, this is an extension of what I was doing now and I'm going to continue to do it. Yeah. Um, and so what that eventually took the form of was, um, you know, I marked, I marked like the, a month later um, with like a post and it's like, this is, you know, this is what I've been through in a month or this is what I've been through in the month since then. And, uh, you know, so I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do this because the 28th as a day took on like the worst possible connotation. So like the 28th is going to be seared into my mind in the same way that like, you know, birthdays, everything else right. is, is you know, there. So every, every sort of day on the 28th of each month after she passed, uh, I'm going to post some sort of remembrance. And I, I wasn't married to like the form they took. Like sometimes it was just like one story. Sometimes it was a collection of stories or facts, um, that, you know, related to maybe the time frame, like whether, you know, it was a holiday or Christmas or, around like some sort of milestone. Um, you know, so I posted each day on the 28th. Um, and I did that for a year. Um, and then she, we had her internment of her ashes, um, about a year later on our anniversary. So that was kind of like the last one was right after that. Um, and so I continued to do it and I kind of stopped Cause I thought the year was like, even though it's somewhat an arbitrary measure, you know, the, the thing about like the public grief on social media is that I never wanted it to feel like it was performative in any way. And that the other thing too, the, the central, uh, the central paradox of this too, is that, you know, you're creating a picture of grief that is selective in some way because you can't share the whole picture. Like it's impossible to share your perfect internal monologue of all of this in, in your day to day. And so there's something that's, there's something that's both a little false about it because it's not a full picture. Did you, did you find yourself feeling you were being false because you couldn't give the full picture? I felt that that was always a concern that you're not presenting the full picture of like, and also like you're not presenting, you know, all sides of it. You're presenting your own side, but like, I never wanted it to feel like it was, uh, it could be construed as like, you know, false. And, and in the social media age, it's also like, you know, it's, it's pounding the serotonin bar of who is going to react negatively. Like I have, a un, like you can, you know, a, a craven way to look at it is I have a serotonin tap. Anytime I post about my grief or about a lease or anything else, it's like I will have a hundred people, you know, react to it in a positive way. And like, that's kind of a dangerous thing in a certain level. I, I could see that. Yeah. Um, so you want to, I always wanted to be cognizant of like, I want to do this from a limited, a limited time and scope. Um, you know, and you know, I, you know, after I did a year, I, I posted, I, you know, I did definitely did posts on some of the bigger dates like anniversary and, and death date and her birthday and things like that. But, you know, with that, with creating sort of this, this narrative, like you're, you're creating a narrative, whether you mean to or not. And, you know, my, my, things were always like, if this is helpful for somebody else, I will continue to do it. Um, and it kind of naturally just, you know, kind of died out after a year. And, you know, I did a few posts where I was just like, 
I feel real fucked up today. Um, I should post about it. Um, so, and through that, you know, one of the things that came out of it is, you know, pretty soon after this happened and I was going through my grief journey, you know, a contemporary of mine from my college was like, Hey, you don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but my partner just got diagnosed with advanced stage cancer. Um, what the fuck do I do? And so that, and she was like, you know, reading your stuff and like, you know, I'm like, send me any questions. I don't care. Day, night, whatever. Just send them to me. Yeah. Um, and through that, you know, in terms of also why I want to do this is like at the end of the day, like if my pain can help people, then like that's the, there's not going to be much good coming out of it besides just feeling the pain and keeping it to yourself. If, if my pain and my experience and my reaction to it can help somebody, especially in the same situation, like I'm going to do it. And you know, there's a lot of people that are like, Oh, you know, if you don't, if you don't want to feel it, you're going to feel pain. I'm like, I'm going to feel pain. I'm going to feel pain. You know, obviously I, I feel pain here. Um, even after it, like rehashing some of it, but that pain is like pretty, if I can help somebody with that pain, like I'm going to do it. Like it's worth feeling that pain again. If someone can just feel a little bit better about what they're going through. Yeah, let's just pause real fast and th talk about how extremely noble uh, and brave and empathetic that is. And that's, I commend you. I mean, seriously, that's amazing. And, and you know, you reached out about being on the show and, and you, you said the same thing to me when we were, we were discussing before we recorded that one of the things that you wanted to do with, with your grief journey is to be there and share with other people who who might be going through the same. And I, I guarantee you today, um, a, a, as we've listened to your story that the, you have helped so many people who are listening to this. Um, I, I, I can think of so many people in my mind that will hear this and will be helped. So you, thank you. I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely doing it. There was one other thing that you wanted to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. which is dating as a widower. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about dating as a widower. Yeah. So with, you know, I'll start this by kind of leading into it where, you know, I'm, I'm about, I'm around 35 at this point. Like I was around 35 when Elise died. Um, and you know, you go out and you have new experiences, you meet new people, you make new friends. And it's like, when do I tell them this piece of information about myself, which might not, which they probably don't know? Like, how do I do it? Especially as young as you were. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's literally like you feel, there's a couple things that you feel is like, you know, A, when do I share this? And like, am I withholding from somebody? But B, at the same time, like, I know as soon as I say this, um, <laughs> what, uh, what's the reaction? Because it's going to grind any conversation to a halt. How sure. do you, how do you coolly be like, oh yeah, and last year my wife died? Um, because it's just going to completely, um, grind the conversation to a halt. <laughs> Um, and kind of, and it, it, then it also makes, you know, the, the very Midwestern things of not wanting to make things about you. Um, man, that is a Midwestern thing. It immediately comes about you for the next 15 or 20 minutes. And is it almost like you're going back to, um, where you're then now comforting that person in yeah. a sense, because now they're like, uh, we yeah. were just here at this brewery. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's like, yeah, it's, it's, and then you're going to be saying it's okay for the next, you know, 15 minutes. Like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, I know it's okay. Um, so, so there's part of that and just feeling like you're carrying this in, incredibly piece of heavy information and somebody you want to have, you know, a relationship with, even as just a friend, like that you just met, it's like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a very tough one. But, um, part of my support network afterwards was, um, a cousin of mine by marriage who lost a husband even younger than I did. Um, and she's like, you have the ultimate barometer now. 
Like, you know exactly what kind of person it is after you tell them this. And based on how they react, you can tell exactly what kind of person they are. And that is 100% true. Did you have anybody go, yeah, and? Or something horrible like that? Well, no. Okay, that's no. good. No, I mean, I, I never really had that because I, I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I do have introverted tendencies, so I tend to choose pretty carefully. Um, so, but there's not that. It's just like the people who are like super awkward about it. And then there's like people who like, it's like, it's the same as anything else. It's like, it's exposing a vulnerability. And like, is that person going to expose a vulnerability in response or are they just going to try and like make this conversation go away? There you go. Um, so, you know, I was always kind of bullish about that, especially if someone says something along those lines, like, you know, I'm cognizant of like, I have my own thing, but like, I'm, I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, and you know, I was always said like, ask me any questions you want. Um, I've probably considered them or probably can consider them without having a meltdown. Um, so that's the one thing. And then just the idea of this was somebody who was my partner for, um, the better part of, uh, 13 years. So from about 2004, the end of 2004, early 2005 to 2018, you know, 13 years together. Like, how do you even restart that? And obviously like, you know, because I'm a, a young person, like I still want companionship. I still want, you know, a significant other. Um, so around about a year is when I started to kind of get considered again. And how do I go about that? Like, okay, like let's try these, uh, these new apps that uh, yes. the kids are, uh, the kids are fond of. Um, I literally, I took a lunch meeting. I took a lunch meeting with a, a former colleague uh, who was the self-professed master of the apps who coached me through building a profile and some basic <laughs> etiquette um, with said dating apps, um, which was uh, hilarious <laughs> um, on several levels and absurd. Um, and... Uh, then you know into the into the wide dating world app and then just kind of letting it go and striking up various conversations and you know i had i started talking to someone and like we we kind of said like yes we should we should meet in person yeah. and um uh this was uh 2019 and uh they were like uh yeah how's the um how's uh june 27th oh jesus and i was like yeah yeah that's uh that's fine so did you meet with them i did yeah so i had my first post date as a widower the day before the anniversary of my wife's death and it was a very good date it lasted a very long time um uh, and we talked for a very long time. And then through that, you know, I felt comfortable enough to be like, um, Hey, here's this piece of personal information. And she was fantastic. We had a couple other dates afterwards. It did not lead anywhere. Um, but, uh, she was obviously lovely. And I feel like the first post, uh, the post order date could have gone a lot worse. Um, so yeah, dating and just, it, it kind of became a rule. Like I had some profiles where like I, I put that information on there and some that I didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to kind of see, and, um, you know, usually, usually I had kind of the, the rules where it's like, okay, let's have, let's have a couple of solid back and forth to know that you are like a person and can hold a conversation. And then, you know, you know, let's not, let's actually meet to see if there's actually any chemistry and, and kind of go from there. But usually like a lot of conversations would take the form of like talking about that or mentioning that. And like most of the dates that I considered would be good, you know, usually we tackled that and like got through it or got past it. Um, and I started dating my current partner in, uh, another, another God, another first date. That's just like, why would you do this? 
um, <laughs> we were talking and like trying to set up a date and like we eventually set up a date for uh, New Year's Eve. Um, for a first date? For a first date. All right. Um, Cause it's like, Oh, let's do something tomorrow. I'm like, there's nothing going to be open tomorrow. Like it's yeah. New Year's day. Like, so we had a, we had a very good first date and obviously have been, uh, how long have you guys been together? So we're going on over a year and a half, um, year and a half, like at least like, cause we started dating in like very easy to remember that anniversary, January 31st in, uh, 20, uh, 22. So 2021, 2022. So, um, basically since January, 2022. And then we moved in three months ago. That's awesome. So, and that's been, she has been great. We had, it's both good because it's the right person and, you know, harder because it's the things that you don't consider. Um, so, I always wanted to be cognizant of like not wanting to be in the exact same pattern I had with Elise, um, as I do with my new partner, Deanna, um, and not imposing that relationship I had with Elise and Deanna. And like that, that was never a problem. Um, cause Deanna's awesome. And first of all, I wouldn't stand for that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but you know, then in terms of like a lot of the stuff that was just like in the bones habits of like, you know, how I, kept the house and how the house appeared. And it's like when she was moving in, you know, we had a lot of tough conversations about like, this still feels like her space in some ways. Mm. And like, I'm concerned this will never really be my space. And I'm just like, everything's on the table in terms of like, if you want to take stuff down, if you want to move stuff around, like I am for it. And we've done that to us and we're, you know, we got like the main move done. And like, so we're kind of like targeting things and like to make it more ours um, than it was. But, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, she struggled with and rightly where like, I, you know, I walked into my place and there was like above, I have like a set of French doors that separate my, my dining room and my living room. And uh, you know, that's where I have like the last pictures of like Elise and I, um, up there. So she's like, yeah, I come in and I immediately feel like it's her space. And I'm like, can I move them to the other side of the door? So you don't walk into that. Cause I don't want to take them down, but I'm more than happy to move them or relocate them. Mm -hmm. And then some of you know, that's obviously a big thing. And that's something that always needs to be dealt with. But like, it's this, it's the little things, which is like, I'm like, you know, me and Elise always had a rule. Like if somebody cooked, the other person cleaned mm -hmm. and it's like, and I'm like, that seems totally reasonable to me. Like, but it's like, no, that's your rule. Like, we need to make our own rule. I'm like, you know what? You're right. Like, even though I was cognizant of not wanting to replace old habits, like that's immediately what I would like suggest or fall into. Right. So there needs to be another level of scrutiny that, and in terms of listening to your partner, to do it and like we've been very open in terms of doing that and like finding the new routine and like it's it's one of those things where like you couldn't plan it like you couldn't just say like we're gonna do x y and z it's just like we'll get in there we'll move in and we'll we'll see what happens and we'll set it yeah. as it goes and that's what we've done and it's been pretty successful um so it's it, it's kind of a lot and it's it's also like the, the other thing is, you know, I was, Elise's family lived here. So like her family is still around. So it's like, I really like her family. And, you know, it's one of the things is like, how does that relationship develop? Like, how do you introduce? And like, you know, Deanna, to her credit was, I think, incredibly brave in going to a gathering last year that was like ostensibly around you know, to sort of mark Elise's passing and like in like June of like within six months of us dating, like that was kind of going into the lion's den, yeah. so to speak. And, you know, we definitely talked about how we want to, how we manage that relationship. Um, and, you know, to her credit again, like, I'm like, you know, she's like, you've got to be more cognizant of like, 
you know, I'm more than happy to have a, a relationship, but like in terms of like family, like, and, and, and doing it, you have to be more kind of, especially around holidays, like, cause her family's around in town and like, you know, obviously got my family and her family's very close in, in terms of geographically. So it's just like, we kind of set like a no holiday rule of, you know, obviously people's in town, but you can't go and just do like the holidays with Elisa's family. Um, which, you know, I get on a certain level. And like, I was kind of like, you know, I really like her family. And like, I'm like, you know, that's a tough ask for a significant yeah. other. That's a very tough ask. And like realizing, I don't think I realized how tough it was. And I think, you know, she very much set me straight in terms of like setting those, setting those boundaries and setting like, not just like setting her boundaries and being very clear about her boundaries with that subject. Um, and I appreciate it. And like, it's, it's been, again, it's been working like, cause you know, like the grief and like everything else, you sort of have to, anytime you expect something to go a certain way, it's probably going to change and mm. it's probably not going to cooperate with you. So like, if you set these rules ahead of time and then like you actually get in there and then like, this isn't working at all. What do we do now? It's like, no, just give it, give it space. Yeah. Give it space. So that's, you know, to make like a bit of a, you know, a coda or a wrap up, it's like you go from like thinking, you know, the worst possible thing of like your partner, like that's, what's the worst possible thing. It's like, you know, having, having a partner die, um, um, or God forbid, you know, a child, if it, if it comes to that, but you know, at the end of the day, um, uh, you can come out the other end, like, and that's my takeaway. And what I tell people is like, you can have the worst possible thing happen to you and you can not only survive, but you can recover and, you know, it's always going to be there. But at the end of the day, what I said to myself when she was di when Elise was diagnosed was like, whatever happens, I don't know what's going to happen. I didn't know what's going to happen at this point. Um, I want to come out, the, come out of this a better person. And so that's, what's animated a lot of my decisions, um, to, to try and be better and to try and be a person that she would appreciate and recognize as, as worthy. And my grief is, is, is a, is a key part of that. And knowing, knowing that I can come back from, you know, one of the worst possible experiences and the most amount of pain you can feel as a human and not just survive it, but also be like, I can find this and form a connection, a meaningful lasting connection with another person. Um, with this, with having been what I've gone through, which I think some people, I, I understand some people like this happened. I can never feel this again, but at the end of the day, like that grief can make you better. Mm. And, um, what I kind of tell everyone is like, you know, who's going through grief or like had some sort of loss. It's like, do you want to be better or worse for this? Like, cause you can make a decision like to a certain extent you can make a decision. It's not going to be an easy road either way, but like, can you imagine saying like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be good for this or I don't want to be better for this. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I try not to imagine that. That's not, I was yeah, saying, no, yes, it's... I understand. <laughs> um, no, you don't, you don't, you don't want to imagine that. Yeah. And I, I have to say, Elliot, that is a perfect coda. I think that's a perfect thing to end on and wrap up on. And I want to say again, uh, thank you for coming on and sharing yeah, your story. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. And uh, just a really powerful story and just really, really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate, I appreciate the, the kind of the, the format and the, the message of what this is, which is why I jumped at the chance to help out. 
Awesome. Yeah, it, it was great, man. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, and we'll wrap up the same way that I always wrap up, uh, which is just a reminder that there is, um, there's always room for kindness and grace, no matter the situation, even with yourself. Um, I forget that all the time and I try to remember it every day, but just remember there is always room for kindness and grace. And we will see you next time on Sad Times. You've been listening to a fourth hand joint.